Good morning. I am the Reverend David William Parry, and it is my privilege, and that is genuinely meant, to welcome our social media listeners, honoured guests, international viewers, and exceedingly gifted participants to this Nephilim Anthropology Conference UK 2021. The sun is out. It's a blindingly resonant day, so I'm having trouble seeing my notes. Please bear with me, but we will get there, I promise. Altogether, a fundraiser for my Abrahamic Botanica Books and Chapel, the latter being a metropolitan community church oasis. We're very, very, very proud of that as well as a genuinely unique intercultural and interdisciplinary study of respected experts approaching one of the most bewildering biblical secrets. As such, this groundbreaking event marks the launch of a three-year-long project initially conceived in 2013. Hard to think back to those days in some ways, but that's the case. Wherein I was assembling a group of scholars in their respective fields to discuss the phenomenology of mysterious passages in holy scriptures like Genesis 6, along with crystal skulls, bloodlines, giants, UFOs, and antediluvian demigods. Whether we think they're metaphors uh, or we think they're myths with a classical M, but you know, there's evidence in, in paintings, in, in architecture, in engravings, and so on. You know, I thought that was good to look at, you know, all of these resources and see what we're, where we were going with them. I think that's still important, by the way. Each weirdly interrelated subject testifying towards unarguably religious facts, which nevertheless demand genuine scrutiny, I would humbly suggest, by believers, agnostics and skeptics alike. An enterprise looking back that had reached the final stages of organization before our modest credit line was unexpectedly withdrawn by a local bank, speech marks for our own good, closed speech marks, I'll never forget that as long as I live, flights had been booked, accommodation had been booked, and all of it came crashing down around, of our, around our proverbials, I'll never forget that, uh, for our own good. Uh, and the entire endeavour, as I say, collapsed without the slightest possibility of reviving it at that time. Indeed, it was my very firm and good friend, the Reverend Jim Wilhelmson, who had cryptically said during the planning stages of our enterprise that the Nephilim did not like being discussed and tried to keep away from the limelight. So I should be careful. I confess I brushed that comment to the side. But hey, looking back, those words proved to have prophetic status. Anyway, apart from finding myself called as a minister of religion, my other vocation is that of a British theatrical, a distant relation, an abstract relation. I mean, I've directed and uh, produced plays sometimes, even acted. Can you believe that? But it's, you know, it's more of a passion serving a, a dream than, than an actual calling, but a real calling nonetheless. Um, and as such, I did not appreciate the premature closing of a good show. Hence, the gauntlet was thrown down until the uh, launch of our conference today. A bigger and undeniably better enterprise than before. I have to pause there. Keep it going. Keep it going. Three, two, one. Obviously, this stated 2021 has forced us into a virtual gathering with a hybrid roundtable event to be convened in October. And there wasn't a single venue manager that we came across who was willing to take the risk with the perpetual lockdowns. You know, we had to go with the flow. We had to do what we were expected to do. But I suppose that, you know, the endless lockdowns, the two lockdowns have convinced me of one thing. Hybrid events are really amazing. You can reach really distant audiences and have people assemble at the, you know, at the same time. Starting, therefore, virtually, but moving on to hybrid, and I think we're looking at a very exciting times. However, from 2022 and 2023, we will see our community meeting within a number of legendary locations as our deliberations unfold 
about negative energy. Are they related to the Nephilim? Let's try and find out. So my hope is as things unfold, that basically we have a stronger understanding of mystery, biblical origins. Don't take the Bible at face value. There's something very misty in the antiquities. The time scales are not clear at all. Even if you're looking at a rigid 6,000 years, they're not clear. Everything gets very, very misty. If you're looking at the Garden of Eden, what time scales are we talking about? Let's explore it. End times. That's on everybody's lips at the moment in a variety of forms. Let's look at what people are saying. Along with spiritual enlightenment, can our understanding of these rather recondite subjects actually lead us to a greater understanding of ourselves and maybe what lies ahead of us, inside of us, in our minds, in our hearts, and in our future as evolving human beings? Caveats. Uh, the whole strength of our panel is its diversity. It has a number of different views from a number of different angles. Scholars are coming from a, a multiplicity of paths and, and viewpoints. That is our strength, not our weakness. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable with some of those things, please place on the back burner those things that you think don't really fit your own view, that you, you think challenge you in an, you know, in an uncomfortable way. But maybe keep it on the back burner and don't push it away for future reference. How knows how things unfold? Who knows how things unfold in, year, in the years ahead? You know, don't be offended. Don't be upset. Give everyone a fair listening. Give everyone a fair hearing and see how the different viewpoints of the subject of lost civilizations, giants in our midst and biblical origins actually affect you. You know, because I think scripture actually leads in with global scripture, but that's a, that's another thing entirely. The above stated, uh, as I was saying, uh, I'm hoping we can involve all the sons and daughters of Abraham. In other words, Muslims, Jews, Sikhs, anybody that claims descent from that particular religious current in our roundtables, in our discussions amongst the panelists in the years ahead. You know, if we all get together and share our knowledge, as I say, I'm particularly interested in the interplay between Nephilim and Jinn. I think there's a lot going on there. You know, if we all share what we've learned in our different cultures, our attitudes to the unknown, our, our grasp of the occult, our, you know, our understanding of the esoteric, and again, what our grandmothers and grandfathers told us from time immemorial perhaps we'll get a different view, an expanded view of the material that's actually before us. That is my hope as these things unfold. Let's try and grasp a greater truth than the ones we're looking at at the moment. You know, through a glass darkly, let's let the fragments of truth come together into a greater vision. Sikhs, by the way, uh, it's been drawn, drawn to, I've, you know, I've had it drawn to my attention that Sikhs, the Sikh community, particularly, I think, in Southall, would like to take a, a part in these deliberations. All I can say is um, I'm a deep, deep friend of the Sikhs. I've enjoyed their hospitality on many occasions, and they are noble and proud people that I would be equally proud to have involved in these discussions. Taken together, what are we going to look at? Artifacts, folk memory, and spiritual realities shared by all of the people who participate. Or meaning today marks the start of a genuine quest into the unknown, demanding patience on all of our parts, goodwill, that missing factor in, many, in so much of modern life nowadays, and mutual understanding. Let's not go down the route, I'm disagreeing with you because you've got a different ideology and a different religious view. Let's, let's push that to the side and see what we can really learn about the supernatural. I personally do believe there's a supernatural, which of course would be the step above the all embracing vantage point above even the paranormal. You know, and is it interacting with us? For, for one, I personally think it is. Let's see what that might actually mean through our discourses and discussions. Phrased alternatively, 
please take those nuggets of knowledge you find meaningful from our discourses for your own reference while placing on the back burner the uncomfortable. I urge everyone with that in mind to stretch their minds, open their souls, and expand their hearts. What I mean, what would be so wrong with that? Isn't that a good thing to try and do? In order to grasp those supernatural and sometimes genuinely terrible, dare I say horrific, narratives surrounding human experience throughout the ages. The Nephilim, after all, were giants. They were giants and cannibals that didn't tend to have a good attitude towards human beings at all. They saw us either as rivals or potential replacements, which of course may have been the case. Um, since I'm, I'm uh, a clergyman, you'll forgive me for opening our proceedings with a brief and informal prayer. Um, may those high and mighty powers of light above us accept the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts as we move forward in this wonderful day of discussion. Overview. On a personal level, I, I confess, I don't know where I stand with all of this. My own background is moral theology. I tend to gravitate towards Christian existentialism as an interpretive frame of reference. Um, therefore, tales of fallen angels, the sons of God acting inappropriately, I just find that too mind-blowing, um, not to mention their repellent large and inordinately strong offspring remain an enigma i i need to confess that you know it just leaves me uh hornswoggled i really don't know what it's all getting at but i want to learn i want to learn because the supernatural in, intrudes through scripture after all do narratives of this type refer to the descending arc of cosmic processes as madame blavatsky would have said pure cosmic spirit coming down through the different layers and manifestations of densities and matters only to turn the arc yet again back to supernal glory is that what we're discussing or are we talking about the relics the, the codifications of lost civilizations is that what we're discussing or dire warnings maybe of the shape of things to come intuitions felt by our ancestors experienced by our ancestors of a human race us maybe who are far too wise in the sciences but not not in the uh, in the arts of ethics to be reckless in our genetic heritage some of the things i've been hearing recently about genetic experiments involving you know ape and human genes are, are genuinely frightening as rabelais said science without a conscience is the ruin of the soul something we need to bear in mind Let's not make any judgments. All in all, I personally don't know, but I'm willing to learn and I want to learn as these discussions open, even though I am certain that all of us will have reached a different vantage point in our understanding by the time these conferences have come to an end. I'm now going to ask members of my, my team to put some wonderful visuals uh, I had uh, uh, personally collected to try and explain a little my own view. Um, when we came across that image, I, I felt that was perfect. I mean, if I'd have had the chance to participate as a panelist myself, I wanted to talk about Nephilim and art. Um, I'm not sure, I've got a rather snooty opinion of the arts. I'm not sure I, I include this as art, but it's certainly a very striking concept on the level of conceptual creativity. It's very, very telling about the watchers. Um, this superior intelligence lying through his teeth Yes, of course he did, referring, of course, to the Almighty, and deliberately bewildering an innocent and naive humanity to the intentions of these powerful and intrusive beings. I liked, uh, I liked every single bit of that, the fact they've got no conscience, which is shown in the fact that the eyeballs are missing and the colouring of the skin. I just thought that was incredibly pertinent. Those who fly above that fathered a disaster. And as some say they tried to, to make amends, others say no, they didn't. Um, I remember Chuck Missler, a, a very gifted evangelical preacher. 
I'm sure he's shining with the angels nowadays. He passed a couple of years ago. Um, thought that they were as far below Hades as Hades is below heaven in a place called Tartarus. Um, actually, the other worlds post-mortem in Christianity can get very, very complex. Something people who aren't really uh, on top of Christian tradition tend to forget. We'll move on to our next image. Um, which leaves me the chance to talk about the one last vantage point of this conference. The new anthropology. There is a reason why this gathering is called Nephilim Anthropology. A dear friend of mine, the author Vladimir Wiedemann, approached me in 2013 to talk about this very subject. It was being hotly debated in Moscow, uh, particularly Moscow State University, as far as I recall, during uh, the collapse of during the collapse of the Soviet Union, during the time that Glasnost was starting. Therefore, these hot debates never actually made it to the West, um, which is a shame. Plus, the Iron Curtain and the lack of funding stopped these rewritings of human evolution of human history from actually getting excuse me, much attention here. As far as I know, there was a rather snotty paper in Oxford, uh, a very ill-informed one from back then, that's making judgments about a subject they did, clearly didn't know about. But let's explore another vector. Are we actually talking about a much more serious and much more complex uh, view of human origins than has actually surfaced so far? I mean, to, uh, certainly what you're looking at there is uh, our images of the crow people. They were discovered by William Corliss. Uh, all of them, uh, none of them get, let me say that differently, none of them are bigger than 36 uh, uh, inches in height. He discovered hundreds of them in a burial, uh, a sacred burial mound for that particular group. Therefore, you know, humanity, and yes, let's assume they're human, please. Um, humanity can be small, it can be giant, it can be all sorts of things. If we're following the new anthropology, you know, the, the sturdy homo sapien and the relatively same size Neanderthal are simply a simplification of what the sciences themselves need to start grappling with. So you're looking at um, images of the crow people, um, probably to my knowledge of the smallest possible group in the past, although I heard recently, which is one of the reasons I couldn't complete these notes, that there are groups even smaller. We'll now move to my next image. If there were small groups, were there large groups? I mean, certainly the idea in The Secret Doctrine, uh, a book that mustn't be poo-pooed or dismissed too easily, no matter what one's view of it, is that there were antediluvian civilizations. And of course, they were very, very, very advanced. Maybe not in a technological way that we are today. Their technology was different, but certainly on a par, if not uh, actually from an advantage point of superiority compared to our own. Um, as far as I remember, because I read all those materials many, many years ago, the, the motherland of Mu uh, really saw the, the gigantic species of that which would one day become human. Um, of course, they're not really fully physical in any sense that we know, that we'd really understand at that stage. Gigantic beings that are sort of part spirit, part psyche, part physical, that eventually fall into the Atlanteans, who were more or less physical in a way that we'd understand it, but of course still bigger, stronger, and basically brighter than anything that's known today. I'm not saying I believe in those things. I'm not saying I don't. I'm saying the phenomenological attitude of our panel will explore those things. And certainly if we look at some of the megalithic sites, you know, the gigantic monuments and cities that have been left in the world today, isn't that an interesting point of departure? And certainly something we need to discuss. We'll now move on to my next slide. Of course, in, uh, in the Bible itself, uh, uh, you know, Nephilim, to my interpretation, simply means giant. There are stories of giants across the planet, which is why we can't simply say it's a biblical or Hebraic story. You know, there are more to it than that. 
Certainly the one that obviously always comes to mind is David and Goliath. Goliath was actually a Nephilim, not simply a big warrior from the, those that opposed the children of Israel. And also the story tends to be misunderstood these days. David knew he couldn't defeat him in unarmed combat. He was too big and too strong. So what he does is he uses his slingshot to stun Goliath and then uses Goliath's own sword to sever his head. Um, quite a different complexion to that story once we begin to look at it, you know, uh, from an outside angle, but certainly not a unique story in many ways. I love that particular image because, of course, David is thanking the heavenly powers for defeating his oppressors. Um, maybe we all need to defeat our oppressors more and more nowadays. And we'll look at the next image. The Nephilim respected nobody and nothing. Um, they felt, if we look at the scripture in particular, that really human beings were taking their territories and their birthrights. Sometimes this would erupt, particularly if we're looking at Hebrew folklore, into a number of clashes and encounters that are just simply unpleasant and genuinely bloodthirsty. Um, certainly my own view tends to be historical. Um, I'm not saying these things are historical. As I've said previously, I don't know. I will say that the warlike attitudes of our ancestors and their more tribal attitude to life mustn't be forgotten. They weren't children of the Enlightenment. They weren't Democrats. You know, they weren't people looking for everybody to come together and have a group hug. They tended to be our ancestors much more militaristic in their outlook and saw their, their tribal identity as the best in a world of competing alternative tribal identities. Therefore, you know, let's look at that and does that hold water? Certainly in this particular caption, there's an image of the Nephilim as the unwanted intruder amongst the Israels, and that itself needs discussion. There we're looking at the lawgiver trying to direct the children of Israel through some very strangely written passages into the promised land, Canaan. Um, they were meant to be Nephilim in Canaan of a gigantic proportion. My trouble with some of those stories is if they were simply physical beings, I don't know how their biology could have managed to actually hold them together. How could they stand up straight in gravitational conditions such as our own? Something that made me draw back from that was actually listening to Chuck Messler. You know, it might come as a surprise that someone of my particularly liberal Christian background has sort of an esoteric sympathy and a, and, and a look uh, and an attitude of great embracing towards all of that. Yes, I do. I've never hidden it. Um, it. Listening to Chuck Messler, the conditions precurse of Earth, the conditions of Eden would have been very, very different to our own, a different gravity. Uh, everything seems to be full, more full of light and monstrous. Everything seems to be gigantic, in other words compared to what we, we were left with after the curse. Interesting thoughts, basically illuminating what we think we know about the Bible. This is not simply a discussion of scripture. That said, we are going to look at the scriptures of all the world, planetary scripture. We're going to look at all the resources I previously mentioned, and we are going to form a community genuinely interested in unearthing one of the most colossal of all enigmas haunting our past and threatening our future. My dear friends, that's basically come to the end of my intro. I just wanted to guide people through that. I will have the honor of introducing each speaker in turn, uh, saying a little about them and uh, opening the uh, breakout rooms as and when we get to those times in our schedule. Have a blessed and wonderful day, my friends. Um, if there are any questions to finish off my, my slot, I will finish them now before we move into our first speaker.